Thank you. Um, thanks for everybody being here. Uh, anyway, so I'll tell you about the where this came from. I was at a workshop by David Powell, and it was called Compassion Fatigue. It was down in Holyoke. We sponsored it, and I went there. And I, David Powell's a, well, I respect him. I think of him as a mentor as counseling, and uh, I, it was a... It was okay. It was an interesting conference, and uh, I'll tell you one thing that happened. At one point, we did a self-test, and the self-test, I guess, was supposed to measure compassion. And um, I was at a table with two or three other uh, mental health practitioners, and uh, we, all of us probably had about 80 years of time in the service. And, uh, and uh, when we got done with the test, I, I, I did not get an egg. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, it reminded me of grade school where I had like room for improvement, you know, like we should do more. And I, literally, someone, I mentioned uh, something about uh, what to do about clients who have died. And when somebody came to me after the class, and they were from the Barbara area, and they said, you know, we should do something about that to support each other. And uh, that was probably about two years ago, and I've been thinking about it ever since. Um, you know, I read, I, I, I think about things, I read things, I'll, I'll tell Drew, I said, well, I'm thinking about that, or, I, I, you know, I've been looking at this, and there'll be an article in the Wall Street Journal, there'll be an article in the Times, and I'll look at it, and I'll read it, and I, so, when Gay came to me and said, you know, we want to do this workshop, would you like to do something? I think she was sort of prepared for me to talk about Suboxone or <laughs> Methanone or something to that effect. And I said, no, I'd like to do something about, um, about, about what happens to us as counselors, as mental health practitioners, and what that means over time. And uh, so it was sort of difficult. I, I, I couldn't find a good title. I was trying to think about ways of talking about this because I... In my mind, in my focus, I don't want to talk about people burning out. I mean, that's not what this is about. So I'm not, I know it says somewhere there, learning objectives, you know, uh, symptoms of burning out. Well, if you feel like toast, you're burning out. Um, um, and, I, no, I don't, and I also, I'm not sure I really want to talk about uh, vicarious traumatization. Because that sounds, oh my God, you know. Uh, what I was really hoping to talk about is the fact that I think that what we go through in our experiences make us better therapists, make us better people. And, and the, the word that I was struck with, and I've been talking about grief and everything for years, is, is that we have to go through it. We need to experience our sadness. We need to experience our grief um, in order to sort of grow from it. I think from our pain and I, uh, from our sadness and sorrow, I think that's where our wisdom comes from. I think that's where our joy comes from, quite frankly. So that was the idea. And then, you know, I had to pick up a title. You know, if you ever do these presentations, picking a title is like, you know, the probably the most difficult thing you can do. And I decided that I didn't know what word to use, and I was trying to think about how to talk about it. And so I used the word sorrow. And if you notice in your handout, I, on the back of one of these pages, from Webster's Unabridged International Edition, is a, I copied out the definition of sorrow at, at the library, which, if you notice the page sort of curves in, that's because the dictionary is like this, and I'm trying to copy it on the skin. Anyway, it was an exercise. The research librarian had to call on a young person to help us with the computer. Um, <laughs> But what I thought about, and I want to say this, is that, you know, there's sorrow, and, and, and I know, to me, that's, I mean, I wanted to know, why did I think that was the right word? Why did I think, I mean, you know, why do words come to our mind unsolicited? And, and there's a reason why. I mean, you know, our unconscious tells you what the word is that we need to express. And... I wasn't going to tell anybody what they should believe sorrow is, but I would like to share with you what I think it is. Almost at the bottom of the page, you'll see the word regret. It's about six or seven sentences above the thing. And I'd just like to read what, what it says. <laughs> regret implies a sorrow, usually not outwardly manifest, and may designate pain of mind 
or spiritual anguish induced by disappointment, lost opportunity, or heartache, ranging in intensity from the mildest of momentary unhappiness at an invitation decline to intense pangs of remorse for a wrong done, usually signifying lighter rather than intense feelings. So when I think about working with clients and working with patients, and, and, um, and quite frankly, some of the patients over the years have died. Um, I think I have a certain regret, and I worry about this lost opportunity for growth, for getting better. Um, and so that's how I wanted to talk about it. And I think, I think it's helpful for us to acknowledge that within our field, we have a sense of, you know, we're altruistic, we're trying to help people, we're trying to do the right thing, we're trying to be here for people who are in, in, in pain, people who are suffering. And that's a worthy thing to do. I mean, it's, it's an incredible uh, career choice, especially once you've been through it, once you've been educated and trained. At some point in your career, you'll decide that this is something I want to do. And, and I, I would imagine Anyway, I think, that's, I, I think that's like one of the things that you have to sort of come to grips with is that you are going to experience sorrow. You will have regret. You will fail. Not sad. Um, the other thing I want to mention, in the title I said, The Sorrows of Helping. Um, I was talking to two doctors, and I, I, I've talked to a lot of people, by the way. I interviewed probably at least a dozen, maybe two dozen people uh, about this. I mean, I just wanted to know how people did it. Um, and I talked to mostly my friends because anybody else, if I went up to you and said, I'd like to interview you, you'd be like freaked, you know, go, what does he want, you know? I'm going to get a diagnosis of substance abuse or something, you know? Um, so I, I, asked the, I asked the doctors, I was talking about this word sorrow, and then I wanted to know, I was going to call it the sorrows of, of caring, you know, because we care for people. And part of caring is, is this this risk, if you will, but more likely the almost for sure that you will experience some sadness and some sorrow. And so I asked him, I said, well, what about caring? And the one doctor sort of rolled his eyes and the other doctor just said, oh, we can't go there. I mean, caring is just, how, I, what does it mean when we care for people? What does that mean to so many of us? And I was trying to think, well, what is a word that we can use? And, and what I thought about, because I sit in a lot of community meetings and I hear people share and especially staff. And, and mental health workers will often say, I'm here to help. I'm here to help you. Um, so that's where the title comes from. It's this idea that part of helping people is, 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 and part of being in this field of addiction and mental health is that we are going to experience a certain amount of sorrow. Part of what I want to say, and, and I hope we can, I, I hope this, I've never done this before, so this is my first time doing it. I really can't time myself, but I, I, I have some ideas about how it. Um, I think first of all we have to talk about ourselves. I mean, and I'm not going to spend much time there, but I do. I do think that you have to acknowledge that there's a reason that you're in this field, whatever that is, and I, I, you know, especially if you have come to that point where you decide to stay in the field. But we bring stuff with us. We bring our personal lives with us. We bring what's happening with us. We bring things to us that are, it's part of our interview, it's part of our therapeutic alliance, it's part of our relationship with patients, is who we are as people, our beliefs, who we are. And I think it's sort of important, and, I, and I, I'll, I'll say this later, maybe even better, but I know some of us like to believe that it's our professional life and it's our personal life. And I really don't. I suppose that's true for like you know accounting purposes and payroll and things like that, but I, I don't think it's really true when we talk about ourselves. I think we become who we are. We become what we do. I mean, is that fair of I me mean, to say that? I mean, you know, we spend an awful lot of our waking hours, months, years doing what we do. Don't you think that we become that? That we become those folks. And I asked somebody, I said, well, what, do we, what is it that we do? And I tried to understand this. I said, and I'm not, I'm not simplifying for the sake of, of 
making devaluing of simplifying for, for clarity. What we do is that we listen and we talk. Well, people start doing that at around age two. I mean, you know, this is not any great thing here. But what we do is we listen and we talk and we think and we care. And that's what's different. People, I won't, I mentioned this, I was talking to Fritz, Dr. Greenstrom about this, and I, you know, there's this word, you know, uh, I mean, I hesitate to hear it, kind of, you know, there's this thing that happens when we're talking to somebody that is what we bring to people, and I, I would like to just say that, you know, um, all our life, all our experience is what we bring present to that moment. Well, I hope that works. All our sadness. And there's a quote in there that says something about one of the things that we transform. And I think we are transformers. I think, we, I think at our best, we let people transfer their pain and suffering to something else. We make them feel loved. We make them feel listened to. By the way, I'll probably use that word love every now and then, so don't be offended by it. I mean, it's just, you know, I don't have a definition for it, but, you know, you understand it. So the other, the other thing that I, I think is so important to sort of grasp is that who comes to see us? Who do we talk to? I mean, we talk to people who are, who are suffering, people who are in pain, people who who probably tell us things they don't tell anybody else. People who feel they're at wit's end. People who might feel like they can't go on. People who don't want to live anymore. People who it's so difficult being themselves that they spend every day of their life getting high, trying not to be themselves. So I think we when I talk about this relationship, and I talk about how, what we do, I mean, we think about things, we reflect on things, we, we, we try and, we try and join with them. Now, I was trying to come up with different definitions, and I was thinking about the word sympathy, and I, that doesn't do it for me. Sympathy is, I sort of feel sorry for you because i um, something like you. I don't think that's what we do. I think most of us use the word empathy. And empathy is joining with the patient, but not joining with them. There was a quote that I read. Empathy is, is acting as if we were them. But we are not them. We are not who they are. They are who they are. But in that moment, we act as if we joined them. But we also stand back. We also interpret. We think. We try to think about how we can help them. Uh, I, this is not about counseling or therapy, but I think it's, you, you have to sort of bring that into uh, the perspective. That we care about people and we join with them at most private moments. We talk to them about things that they normally would not talk about. That they're ashamed of. Um, things that they're afraid of. And they have, they have, I hope, they have hope. I was thinking about what we do, and I, was, I laughed to myself, we were like merchants of hope. We can't fix anything. We don't really change anything. We're not, we can't readjust the future. But we can sort of instill in them some hope and belief in their ability to recover and to get better. I was saying to the, a doctor, I said, um, perhaps we intellectualize and we say to ourselves, I can't help everybody. I think, and, the, and right away, the doctor said to me, and, and my friend, I should say, said to me, I have to believe I can help everybody. I believe in my heart I can help everybody. And I, I feel a sense of suspension of disbelief. I believe in my clients. I believe in what I do. 
and I believe I can help. Now, when, when I think about, you know, these different <coughs> words that we use, hope, belief in recovery, empathy, there's one other word I think is so important. And it, 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 it has to do with what we're talking about. And that is that we feel responsible. We feel a sense of responsibility to do our job. To do the best job we can. The Greek, Greek origins of responsibility, RE stands for I, and SPON stands for promise. Responsibility says I will make a promise. That's why we say young kids are not responsible for their behavior, or somebody who is psychotic is not responsible, because they cannot enter into a social obligation. So we say we have a responsibility to our clients. And I hope that's true. I mean, that we feel it every day. It's not just that we get paid for it. It's not just that it's work. It's that we have this responsibility. They enter our lives. We enter their lives. We form an alliance, therapeutic alliance. We form a relationship. But we are responsible. And I think one of the things that I'm concerned about is that you have to have that sense of promise that people will get well, that they have the ability to get well, that you're not taking money under false pretenses, and that this is helpful. My concern, though, is that we sometimes feel responsible when they die. Now, I told somebody who, who, who heard me this morning talking about this, and I, I promised them that I wouldn't make them cry, but I might cry. Um, we sometimes, when they die, have a sense of responsibility, that we let them down. Now, when I was interviewing people, I tell you, there was this interesting dualism. But that, I, the, there was what people would say to me, is that we talk to people with our brain, but we also relate to them with our heart. People would say, I relate to them with my spirit, but I use my reason. Almost always, people would make this division between their heart and their intellect, their training, their education. And I asked this person, you know, I said, well, you know, not to be flippant about this, but you know, the heart's just a muscle. So when you tell me there's a heart, what do you mean by it? And without hesitation, they said, well, now it has to be, it has to be this other kind of love. It's not this thing, you know, though it's found, it's not, it, it's, it's an appreciation, a connection, um, a oneness that says, I feel, I, I have, I've joined with you. And I think at some level, when we talk about people who die or people who, struggle in their life, but they, we, some, we sometimes deal with the intellect. We do M&Ms, we do conferences, we look over our charts, we talk to people about what happened, we see if there's any mistakes, what we could have done different, what might have been different. I think that's all up here. I think it's all, and as a matter of fact, some of us actually keep busy, you know what I mean? We sort of have lots of things to do. And, uh, and I appreciate that, and, I, and, I, and sometimes in our moments of grief, we love to have something to do, um, take us away from this. But I think on another level, we have feelings. We feel. And we're not sure how we do this. I can tell you, like, things that you should do. As a matter of fact, it's a learning objective. Um, things you should do. You know, as healthcare professionals, we have a hard time with people telling us what we should do. <laughs> as a matter of fact, if I told you what I think you should do, most of you will roll your eyes or go get a soda. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You ever, you ever think about the things that you tell others that when someone says them to you, you devalue? Well, I think you should take a bath. Oh, God. Get out, get out. Please, eat more chicken. No, oh, no, I can't do this. And 
and I think under some veneer of professionalism, you know, we hide our feelings and emotions. And what I would like to suggest is that we have to find a way to experience, express our emotions and feelings. And if we don't, I think, I think at some point we will have that trouble being in this field. Um, one of the problems with unresolved grief is that people often are afraid that they're going to be re-injured. That someone is going to hurt them again. And sometimes I think when we know people or we hear a diagnosis or we hear a type of person, we almost cringe. We go, oh, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Not that. And yet when we meet them, we realize they're a person. And they're not a diagnosis. And we're okay with it. And we see them in a much better light. I mean, if you've ever sat in treatment planning where someone is discussing with a client or a patient and you have four or five people mention something, and then one person speaks up, and you just know from their comments that they have connected with their mutant. And the rest of us were talking about their diagnosis. Or their axis four stressors. Imagine that the people we work with, some of them have personality disorders that make it almost difficult to join them, to care about them. I, I think what I'm getting to is that if we have the, I, I, I can't tell you how many doctors and therapists have said to me, I work with what they give me. I listen to what they tell me, because that's what's important. I've, when I used to do a grief group with patients, I used to say, in some cases, the only thing they have to give me is their pain. And I have to accept it as a gift. But to go back, when you think about this sense of responsibility, and someone dies, and you have these feelings, and you wonder, what can I do with these feelings and emotions? And some of us, we don't want to talk about it. And sometimes we go home and we say, we don't want to talk about it. In part of my conversations with nursing and people, I, I, I ask them, I said, when you go home, do you, you know, do sometimes you don't want to talk to anybody? They go, oh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I just don't want to meet somebody. Sometimes I turn on the TV and I see something say and I just turn it off. I can't go there. I've had enough. And it, it's almost as if we've, the well is empty. I can't, I can't give any more. And yet, we turn to people that we love and support, who support us, when we need them. Uh, over and over and over again, I've had people say to me, what got me through this was the people I worked with. That's who got me through this. Folks that I talked to. I was talking to Dr. Maestro, and he says to me, and we were talking about this, and I said to him, what do you think is the most important thing? He said, well, there's probably two things. One, we have to have trust. And the other is that we have to be vulnerable. Now, so many of us are so used to being, oh, I know it, I got this, or, you know, I'm removed from it, or uh, I don't take my work home with me. It's just foolishness. I mean, there is none of this. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I suppose you could do it. But I, I haven't done it. Anymore. You know? Um, really. We're not in the widget business here. You know? You wake up thinking about it. You have moments at night you think about it. And I know, oh my God, you're over involved with your client. Leave me alone. <laughs> and you know, I understand that there's laws, there's HIPAA and everything, you know? But some of us, if we couldn't talk to our loved ones, we would be in big trouble. Now, I'm not saying you use names, but sometimes you have to tell somebody about something. Now, sometimes you don't say anything. Sometimes people say, you want to go here, you want to go there, and you go, no, I, I don't really want to go anywhere. I'm tired. I've had enough. My concern is that people with unresolved grief sometimes, they begin to act as if they care.
they begin to get fear in their mind that somebody will hurt them. That somebody, I remember I did a grief group with Don Dennis. I did it for about three or four years. I was a young man. I was um, just, just a train 28 years ago. And, and we did it in this room, and, then we, and, and, and Don Addis was a psychologist, he was uh, my mentor, and people would talk about all these sad things. I mean, if you've ever been in a grief group in a psychiatric hospital, I mean, you understand, this is, oh my goodness. And I remember thinking, and I know this sounds silly, but I remember thinking that the house cleaner used to come in after our group and clean, you know, and I often wondered, you know, does the vacuum cleaner not work that well? I mean, because of everything that we left there because of everything that was said. And I think some of us carry it around. I think it colors us. And I don't mean this in a mean way, but I think it, I think it shapes us in some ways. And the problem with death sometimes is that it makes us reevaluate what we do. We wonder if we're, if we're worth, if we're, if we do the right thing. We might even question, was I effective? Was I good enough? I think there are times where uh, one of my interviews with somebody, and this is really my purpose in doing this, is that for some of us, when we get through this, we're no longer naive. We sort of know what happens to us. We've been there. And yet we reaffirm our commitment to it. We, we believe that it's the right thing to do. It is the right thing for us to do. Someone said to me, I have no doubt after I lost a client, I have no doubt that this is the right thing for me to do. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's, there's a quote in there about transforming what we have, transforming the pain for the love. So when I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about how to do this in a way that didn't, didn't frighten anybody, but I am concerned that we have a lot of We sort of have a hard time sometimes showing people our feelings. When, when someone says, you have to trust me, and you need to be vulnerable, you need to talk about your feelings. You need to say, I'm scared. I'm unsure. I'm a... And I hesitate to say this because I'm afraid that people will hear this wrong. But sometimes we get angry. We get angry at what happened. We get angry at maybe the person. We get angry at the system. We get angry at something. Now, my concern with unresolved grief, and I often say this to folks, is that if you're not working through it, it isn't as if it just goes away. It will show up in other so if you're feeling frustrated and angry, and you can't talk about it, you don't feel safe to talk about it, the anger will not just dissipate. I mean, perhaps it would be like water that will evaporate. But at some point it will come back like a storm. At some point you will feel overwhelmed. At some point you will say, I just can't keep doing this. I can't do this anymore. My concern is that Earlier, when I said something about not crying, it, someone taught me, and they said, you know, it's like if you, if someone that was an Eastern person that said, this person is known as a rainmaker, and, uh, and somebody went to them and it says, well, how, you know, how do you make it rain? And they said, I don't make it rain, I let it happen. And I think that's how it is with grief. I think you have to let your grief occur. Now, many of us have these rules against grieving. Some of them are personal. Some of them are lifelong. I mean, tell me, how do you feel when you're crying? Are you ever feel ashamed? Are you ever afraid that somebody will see you? Do you ever think about it? 
What if you told somebody that you were crying about a patient who died? Would you be afraid that it was sort of, you crossed some boundary, or you did something wrong, or you haven't had professional standards? I mean, I think it's okay. And the one thing, I want to stress this so much, the one thing that everybody says to me is that I have to have other people in my life. I have to have support. I have to have my peers. People have said to me, I could not have gotten to this without the people that I was with. I, I talked to nursing staff, and I was talking to, oh, Carol Whitaker, I talked to Sue Mello, I talked to Patty, I talked to all of them. And uniformly, what they said made a difference was I talked to somebody. And I felt unjudged, and I felt safe. Now the problem with that is that it takes a long time <laughs> to develop a relationship to be safe with somebody. It just, it just doesn't come natural to us. And so I, I, I would really, and I guess I'm coming to the close here, but I, 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 what I really would say is that, you know, develop a support network. Develop people that you can talk about. Um, you know, after all the, you know, what that we did, and record checks, and all that, after all that is, is done, and you're sort of okay with it, you know, and you've talked about it, I, I would suspect that you need to be careful, that there will be feelings and emotions. And I say this with some concern, but I think you all know what I'm talking about. I would, I would worry about some triggers. I would worry about sort of, not understanding why you don't feel like going to work, or not understanding why you don't feel good about yourself. Wondering about why, why don't I have much fun anymore? Why don't I enjoy the things I used to do? Have I sort of fallen into a pattern? And one of the things, and, I, and please hear this okay, one of the things that happens when we try not to feel pain is that we stop feeling joy. We are so busy not trying to feel our feelings. We are using up all our psychic energy to not feel. And we're not having much joy in our lives. Now that doesn't, I don't mean that in a mean way. I mean we show up, we love our kids, we do the right thing, we do what we have. But have we lost our joy of living? Have we lost the joy of what we do. I was, uh, I was thinking about this. That one of the things that we should come away with, and I've heard someone say, and I'm, I'm so afraid that this will sound oh, what a, what a corny, I guess. I, I think when we go through a, a death, when we go through a setback, we have someone die, and we go through the grief, that we come out of it, and we feel recommitted, and we feel, you know, people, people with unresolved grief sometimes are so afraid of loving again, because loving again is an opportunity to get hurt. Now, I know you're worried that I use the word love when we're talking about clients. And I will say that sometimes one of the ways to protect yourself from getting hurt is to maintain some emotional boundary where you don't go. And by the way, I would imagine some of you already know that in your interviews, where you sort of don't go there. There's times when you say, I can't hear any more of this. I can't do this. I really don't want to talk. Now remember, this is somebody who came to you, someone who you're responsible for. Now I don't mind if you say that, that, you know, after the first week or two weeks, you had a hard time with clients, you had a hard time with even a month, but at some point you have to say, I need to get some help. I talked to an artist yesterday who I have love and respect for, who said, I had to go to therapy. I really did. She said, I was so trying to control everything so nothing bad could happen. And I spent all my time doing that. 
She said, I had to get something. And so I, I guess that's what I'm, I'm hoping. And I think everybody who came here today, and I, you know, what I'm talking about, I think, is the price of your free meal. There is no free meal. Uh, but I think everybody who responded to this, I don't think you did it because it was a free meal. I think you read the words, and you found a reason to come. And I think you recognize. One of the great gifts, and, and again, I'll stop with this, but is to understand we, we have this gift that we have. It's the gift of healing. It's the gift of care. With that gift comes risk. With that risk, by putting ourselves out, we put ourselves at risk. We have to sort of work through that, work through the pain and the sadness to move it on and to make it a transformation. I was reading a book this weekend and I picked it up because I think it sort of speaks to something. He was calling it post-traumatic growth. And he was talking about people with PTSD. Now don't be alarmed because I'm not talking about that. Um, but what he was saying was that we, we have to not keep looking at as this terrible, dead-end, chronic, horrible moment. And that really good therapy transforms and changes it. And that we grow out of what happens. I, I would say some of the people I know in this field who have been in it a long time, I would say that they have learned from those things. I would say that their wisdom was working through those things. Thank you.